Hello, and welcome to episode 107 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrodin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, many other postings. Bill, how are you this morning? I'm doing great, Seth. Outstanding. Uh, we're going to keep trucking along through the history of the Pacific War here, and we're going to start today by discussing one of the more important events of the Pacific theater, or naval history for that matter, uh, that being, of course, the very first carrier battle, Battle of Coral Sea. Uh, while many uh, see Coral Sea as kind of a sideshow to the main event that will take place a month later in the waters around Midway Atoll, Coral Sea was actually a huge event, a really, really big deal, shall we say. Uh, this is where the doctrine for both the United States Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy and their aircraft carriers would first be tested in carrier to carrier, carrier versus carrier battle. Uh, while the hit and run carrier raids of February and March tested American carrier doctrine to an extent, and the Pearl Harbor raid as well as the Indian Ocean raids tested Imperial Navy doctrine also to an extent, this is the very first time, as I said, that both navies tested each other's way of doing things and in the process found things that worked and things that, well, didn't work. So let's dig into it. Bill, set the stage for us. What are we looking at in early May, late February, early, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> late April, early May, early 1942. May. Yeah, great, Seth. Hey, one of the reasons that you and I make such a great team is you know a lot of the personalities involved in each one of these campaigns. During your time at the World War II Museum, you got to meet and do oral histories mm -hmm. with a lot of the absolute, I mean, the individuals who actually did the things we're going to be talking about. Right. In my case, you know, being a retired Navy captain, Pacific Fleet sailor, I steamed these oceans and seas in very, very exact places we talk about. So I looked at, you know, many of the islands that we're going to talk about in most cases through the periscope of my submarine, but, you know, was able to see how tight the, the you know, seas are between Guadalcanal and, and Florida Island or Tulagi, which we'll talk about later. So I understand the dynamic, uh, the constraints of the actual physical space that these, uh, the, we operated against the Imperial Japanese Navy. And in, it's, it's easy to forget that in, Early 1942, carrier warfare, particularly for the United States, was a relatively new thing. The first major carrier attack occurred, was actually the British against the Italians in the Battle of Toronto, which is the British carrier fleet attacking moored Italian Navy ships in 1940, earlier in the war before we joined. And in fact, it was that battle that the Japanese modeled the attack on Pearl Harbor after, because the Italian Navy was in very shallow ports. The British Navy had to figure out how to modify their torpedoes not to bottom in on the harbor of Toronto. Now they used a different tactic or technique than the Japanese ended up using for Pearl Harbor. They actually tied a string to the nose of the torpedo to keep the nose up as it was falling. Whereas, as opposed to the Japanese that put a wooden like, crate on the fins. Um, nevertheless, you know, that was basically the first, the, the second major carrier battle was the attack on Pearl Harbor. And again, it was something that we didn't believe the Japanese were capable of doing. When we come into Coral Sea, this is, we're going to say this over and over again today. It's the first time two fleets ever engaged each other without ever seeing each other. Now, obviously the airplanes sure. saw each other, but it was the first um, detached carrier versus carrier battle in history. And a lot of mistakes were made. Some things were done right, some things were done wrong. And we're gonna talk about that. The Japanese at this point in the war, were trying to take, we're trying to block American reinforcement of Australia. And the way they planned on doing that was by taking Port Moresby, on the, to the west and uh, Tulagi to the east. And then they were going to further reinforce those positions after Port Mosby and Tulagi were strengthened by taking Fiji um, and uh, New Caledonia, which we had, which we were operating, going to be operating out of. And, um, and then in central Pacific, they were going to block our advances to the west by taking Midway 
And in the Northern Pacific, they were going to capture some American territory, actual American territory in the Aleutians Island. Aleutian Islands. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the north, middle, south. And in the south, their first move was on the island of, of Tulagi. Mm -hmm. And I, the Japanese never understood how seriously we would take that. In particular, Admiral King would take, you know, the attack on, on Tulagi and, and how aggressively we would move to defend it. So that's kind of the strategic picture that the United States Navy is facing as King directs Nimitz to direct Task Force 11 and 17 to advance on Coral Sea to block what we believed was an operation called Operation MO, which right. we believed was going to be an invasion and a sea-based invasion on Port Moresby. So at that Take it over there, Seth. That's that's a hundred percent right. I mean, that's a perfect setup. Uh, you know, Operation Mo, as you said, was the planned invasion, Japanese invasion of Port Moresby, and Tulagi was a part of that. Uh, Tulagi is an island that that we're going to hear a lot about here in yeah. the very near future. Not just this episode, but uh, you know, in a little island called Guadalcanal, there, there mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a couple of issues with uh, Tulagi, shall we say? But um, it's the first time you hear about it. You know, the Japanese wanted Tulagi and they took it to um, and it was basically, you know, it was an unopposed landing uh, to set up a seaplane base to patrol those seas uh, in screening for the Port Moresby invasion force. Absolutely. Yeah. So <clears throat> the Japanese send, uh, as as our good friend John Parshall says, the, the, the second team, <laughs> if you will, mm -hmm. a fleet carrier Shokaku, Zuikaku out there to basically uh you know shield the invasion force and then kind of also protect well, and defend against anything there were fleet carriers up. though right and they're part Correct. of the strike force right but, and there was a supporting force as well right R right with, uh, with the next level down of aircraft carriers right it's the shoho is, is shoho. the uh yeah uh, she she is the she's an escort carrier for all intents mm -hmm. and purposes you know what we call an escort carrier is a very very small aircraft carrier with a very small uh, uh air group that's designed to protect the uh, the the force going down that or way. The covering yeah. force, correct. Mm -hmm. So this is a good setup. Uh, you know, we're reading the the traffic analysis. You know, we we talk about this in the next, or I'm sorry, in the in, in the previous episode about Station Hypo with uh, Admiral Sam Cox. We talk about the traffic analysis. We mm -hmm. weren't reading their mail per se, but we knew we got bits and pieces of the messages that we exactly. were able to decrypt. And in fact, Port Mo. The Japanese weren't very clever with their abbreviation since Port <laughs> Moresby starts with an MO. It's uh it's the it it's it's the analysis allows Nimitz to be able to send the forces down there. And the forces that he sends down to the Coral Sea are the Yorktown and the Lexington CV2. Uh, now Yorktown's already in that area of operations right now. Mm. Uh, she's in the South Pacific, she's in the Coral Sea area because. What does she do? She launches a raid just before the Battle of Coral Sea on the island of Tulagi. Tulagi. Yeah. And this uh, kind of, you know, raises the ire of the Japanese. And this is, this is after the Japanese had done this unopposed landing of Tulagi. Correct. And, and we knew that they were going to try to operate it as a seaplane base, and we wanted to stop that. Yeah. And, and this is all due to the 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 intelligence that that uh, that uh, captain layton commander layton and and the people of station hypo were able to decipher um now yorktown goes in there to Tulagi. she launches her air group out there and they have some pretty good success you know they they attack the targets in there they hit several of the uh the the, the ships in the harbor and well, uh, they claim to have destroyed way more than they actually did right, right? which yeah. <laughs> kind of pervasive on both sides in this battle actually yeah. right yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of the stuff that we're going to see here uh, in this battle specifically, more so than really even Midway, uh, mm -hmm. the, the the sighting reports of both fleets. I mean, these guys couldn't have been more wrong. We'll get to that, but, yeah, but yeah. especially one particular site too, really. But uh, it's 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 unbelievable how inaccurate some of these descriptions were. But uh, you know, the Yorktown attacks. Tulagi, her losses for her air group are very minimal, really. It, it's a successful raid. You know, you could almost consider this um, an extension of the hit and run carrier raids that we talk about in episode the 105. Yeah. 
conducted. Yeah, and, and Yorktown mm -hmm. did some too, but not as Enterprise was everywhere. You right. know, Yorktown was kind of scattershot, but but this is an and extension the of that. In command of the Task Force 17 with Yorktown was still Frank Jack Fletcher, right? Correct. He was he was in command during the Halsey uh, carrier raids that we spoke about earlier. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So so Jack Fletcher is is kind of the the Halsey to Yorktown, you know, right. Halsey was always aboard the enterprise until he got mm -hmm. sick before Midway and Fletcher's the same thing. He's, he parks his flag on Yorktown and he just kind of stays there until Yorktown, of course, you know, meets her, meets her demise, but yeah, Fletcher's in charge. And then, um, and task force 11 on Lexington. Yeah. That's under Admiral, Admiral Aubrey Fitch. This is the same mm -hmm. guy who was aboard, uh, who flew his flag aboard Saratoga as uh, Saratoga was theoretically going to reinforce Wake Island in late December 41, mm -hmm. uh, who had to retreat into his cabin after hearing less than Words stellar conversations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And F Fitch does a pretty good job. You know, he, he mm -hmm. he's he's uh, we'll get we'll get into some of the decisions that he makes here uh, in just a bit. But but he does. It's not a guy you hear a lot about, but mm -hmm. he he. He fared pretty well in this, his one really major action of the war. With the um, limitation of, of the way we operated our carrier strike groups, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, you know, and I mean, you, you said it when you started off talking about this, is that this is a learning experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, you don't necessarily want to be learning things as you're being thrown into the fire, per se. You know, you'd like to have your, your operations ironed to a T before you ever get into the fight. But uh, that's just this is the yeah. nature of carrier warfare for the United States in 1942. Japanese are complete opposites of that. They know what they're doing, but we don't. You know? Well, speaking about, <clears throat> about learning, um, I'm reminded that the Naval History and Heritage Command has, has uh, kind of put on YouTube a bunch of videos from the era. And, and some of them were lessons learned videos. And one collection in particular, I recall, is a collection on the Battle of Coral Sea. Mm -hmm. It was actually conducted by the Naval War College in 1950. And the only reason I bring it up is because, number one, it's fairly contemporaneous to done only, you know, a handful of years, I guess, eight years after the battle itself took place with nearly everybody who was present during the battle right. still alive and available to generate what their lessons learned. But the second, maybe even more memorable thing of these videos is that they're they're so racist you can't help but get cringe when you watch them because okay. you have the the narrator of the videos kind of imitating his version of what the Japanese were thinking using a very stereotyped Japanese accent right yeah. in English yeah. and it just it's uh, cringe worthy yeah. but um, but it does kind of contain exactly the right lessons that we were still trying to learn as late as 1950. Mm -hmm. from this battle that took place in May of 1942. Yeah. And and that's, you know, people, historians, you know, often brush this event over because they, you know, you, you talk about Pearl Harbor, a lot of people skip the carrier raids, which we cover. And then people, everybody wants to talk about the Doolittle Raid. Well, Doolittle Raid, yeah, you know. And then they jump over Coral Sea because they want to get to the meet. They want to get to Midway. But Coral Sea was a big deal and and it you know and we're going to get into this in a second yeah. but but it was a big deal and and it's mm -hmm. it's something that taught lessons all throughout the war really for everybody both the united states and the japanese and and we're going to get to that so well, but, be, but before you leave the doolittle raid mm -hmm. you're right it was kind of a widely regarded as a pinprick right it did almost no damage um but it was a moral victory for the united states if it did have one impact on the japanese psyche it well two things number one they knew that they weren't invulnerable right. number two there is some record that they accelerated the southern offensive into port moresby and may maybe accelerated it in such a way that they weren't quite as prepared as they might have been otherwise had we not conducted the Doolittle Raid, which played to our advantage right? in, in Coral Sea. It, this is something, too, that we're going to see uh, it, it, in a lot of Japanese operations from here on out is that, you know, the preparations and some of these events, like specifically you know, Coral Sea to a point, but Midway especially, mm -hmm. the preparations and the plannings, planning was extensive, but it was the way that the Japanese parceled out their forces 
that you know is very overly uh, complex um operational big time, plans yeah. big time We're ridiculous you know to yeah. a point and it's very uh anti mahanian if you will yeah. you know it, splitting their forces all over the damn place as but opposed one to advantage they did have over ours is they uh, all their forces were of the fourth fleet uh the fourth carrier fleet and whereas we had our aor split between nimitz as sink pack and macarthur as pack southwest right. and because of that all of the land-based surveillance aircraft flew excuse me operated under macarthur's command and nobody had overall tactical control of all the forces that were operating in the theater during the Battle of Corsi on the American side, whereas on the Japanese side, they had unity command. Right. Very true. Very true. And, and we're going to see a <laughs> real, real quick. We're going to get into it. You're going to see something that happens here with the disunity of command on the American side here uh, on May 6th. Fletcher and Lexington, uh, Fletcher and Fitch, Lexington and Yorktown uh, unite. Uh, they're they're one group. Uh, and, and Seth, there was a group of Australians here as well, right? Yeah, well, yeah, heck yeah, yeah. We're gonna we're gonna uh, Admiral Crace, Crace, name. Right. Crace, C R A C E, Crace. And they're cruisers and destroyers, as I recall. Cruisers and destroyers are part of the screening force for Admiral Fletcher. So on the sixth of May, Fletcher is aware. They're in the Coral Sea now. He's aware that Japanese CVs, the Japanese carriers, are in the area uh, and that the Japanese invasion fleet is not far behind, that they're making their way to Port Moresby. This thing that that at, that uh, Commander Layton and, and Station Hypo and Joe Rochefort, predicted, yeah. yeah, that they predicted, well, it's, it's happening. So mm. yet again, this is a harbinger of things to come when it comes to Station Good Hypo and, and, and everybody else. Yeah, they, you know, these guys know what the hell they're doing. And... Um, Anyhow, um, Fletcher is aware that the Japanese are coming and he makes, you know, Fletcher can be praised in some things and criticized in others. And I personally, professionally, am not a huge fan of the man. I think he made some significant errors in his judgment, not just here, but off of Guadalcanal too. Well, neither was Admiral King, right? He kept looking right. for reasons <laughs> to fire him. Yeah, well, this potentially could have been one. Uh, aware of the fact that the Japanese are in the area with aircraft carriers, Admiral Fletcher detaches Admiral Crace, the, the gentleman we just talked about, the Australian uh, Admiral's cruiser group, right? cruiser group, to go block the Jomard Passage. Uh, you know, the, he knows the invasion fleet is coming. He sends his cruisers out there to potentially engage in a gunfight with the Japanese and stop this invasion force from Wait, coming. But which, he knows the Japanese have carriers, and he sends these cruisers out by themselves to yes. engage in a gunfight against a carrier force exactly yeah and this is this is where you know you can get very very critical of admiral fletcher i mean mm -hmm. the the results of uh unprotected surface vessels versus aircraft carrier air groups specifically japanese carrier groups had already been shown you know repulse uh, prince of wales are sunk because they're unescorted they don't have air cover they're sunk by japanese well not carrier groups but they're sunk by japanese aircraft mm -hmm. so you know air power over sea power is 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 a known thing you know fletcher had to have known this yet he still risks these cruisers that had crace not been as skillful as he was in his maneuvering he could have lost them all or at least a very great many of them because Lo and behold, no surprise here, the Japanese find them. Yeah. And the Japanese launch several attacks against Crace's cruisers. Mm -hmm. And again, because of Crace's skillful, skillful maneuvering, the, the maneuvering of the skippers of these cruisers and destroyers, none of them are hit by the grace of God. But it's a critical, critical error uh, committed by, by Fletcher here in that he just sends these guys off without any air cover whatsoever. Yeah, it's and, huge. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I hate to do this, Seth, but you know, if we can think, we're going to jump forward to Midway just for a second. Uh -huh. The guy who's in overall command is Fletcher. Mm -hmm. And the guy who commands the other carrier strike force at Midway is some dude named Spruance. Now, Great Spruance Spruance at this point is the cruiser commander for the Enterprise Strike Group under Halsey when they just came back from the carrier raids that we talked about last episode. And when when Fletcher makes the error in Coral Sea of sending Crace's cruisers forward against an um, 
an aircraft carrier force, that's an error that Spruance absolutely avoids making right. in Midway. And exactly. it's just really important to remember that because Fletcher is, in theory at least, Spruance's boss at Midway. Mm-hmm. And so he may he may have been schooled on this Fletcher error that happened in Coral Sea before. And that may be part of the reason why he, he avoids making the same error midway. But we'll talk about that later in our midway episodes. <laughs> episodes, plural. <laughs> but, but um, you know, the Japanese, this this goes on to the scouting and the, and the reports of, you know, we talked about, you know, how much of an error uh, these pilots are making. And, you know, mm-hmm. a lot can be thrown on that, mainly, uh, you know, as far as the Japanese are concerned, uh, they launched three attacks against Crace's cruiser group and don't hit them. Crace's cruiser group is also attacked by, wait for it. Land-based air? Yes, but from General <laughs> Douglas MacArthur's command, oh, that's B-17s. Right, that's right. That's right. Yeah. MacArthur's force attacks Crace's yeah. cruiser force. Yep. Happily, they sucked. Yeah. And they didn't, they didn't hit them, right? They, did, they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn from inside the barn, but... But yet again, this is the you know disunity of command we were talking about here. MacArthur, well, I mean, granted, MacArthur didn't give the order to send the B-17s out there, but they were part of his command. And, you know, the Japanese didn't hit anything, didn't hurt a single ship, yet they make a report out that says they sunk a battleship, which there weren't any. There weren't any. Damaged a second battleship, which, again, there weren't, there weren't any. any. Uh, and a cruiser. And the Japanese sent no further attacks into this area because they thought that they had destroyed this group of women. And in actuality, they never hit a damn thing. Mm-hmm. And there certainly weren't any battleships there to hit. So this this is also kind of touching on what we're going to get into here in a second is, is about the, the poor scouting uh, abilities of both navies. Um, and that can be, you know, contrib- attributed to the fact that, you know, this is the first carrier battle. And even though the Japanese pilots on uh, Shokaku and Zulikaku have seen combat, they haven't been to sea and been, you know, tangled up with an enemy fleet as they're about to be here in the next right. two days. So, you know, we could debate the decision by Fletcher to send these cruisers out there, you know, without air cover for the rest of the episode. And we're not going to, but it's 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 a horrible decision. It's, and it's not the last one that he makes, you know, in 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 his career here in the Pacific War. But uh, let's move on to the next day. So the next day, this is May 7th, 1942. This will be the first day of the Battle of Coral Sea as we know it. Uh, early on the morning of the 7th, Japanese launch searches to find the American carriers. We do the same thing um, to find their carriers that we know are there. Uh, the Japanese scout planes from Shikaku fly, find U.S. ships and Radio Admiral Tagaki, that's the, the fella in charge here on mm-hmm. the Japanese side, of one American aircraft carrier, one cruiser, and three destroyers. Now, obviously, this guy's seeing part of the American fleet, but at least he identifies the ships correctly, or so he thinks. Uh, what the Japanese actually cite is the detached two ships. <laughs> two Yosho ships. and Euler. <laughs> and oiler and a destroyer so he thinks he sees an aircraft carrier a cruiser and three destroyers so that would be five ships when in actuality mm. there's only two and one of them's an oiler and there's no carriers anywhere near there yeah. so it, it's it's again you got to wonder how the hell do you screw this up that damn bad well scout scout planes are flying at very high altitudes so they're they're really only seeing kind of the shape the outline of the ship and an oiler is a big ship okay i can i have I'm just going to shock you to hear this, Seth. I've misidentified ships looking through the periscope before, yeah. but I haven't counted five when they're only two. <laughs> That's and my point. I haven't made that mistake before. And so, yeah, sometimes you see something and you want it to be something so bad. You can kind of see it in there. and But, but you can count. It, yeah, you can count. And, and yeah. the, the, only, the only explanation for this is he wanted to be the hero that discovered the Americans never, never believed that the oiler would be detached from the carrier group or, or the one ship that he saw that we have split the carrier group up. And so he's reporting it and, and he believe, and he's, he wants to be that hero. He believes they're really there and wants to be the guy that reported them and take credit for that. 
Well, he sends this report back, and the Japanese admiral Tagaki, he's like, "Okay, yep, this this is it. This is what we're here to do." Yep. And they launch a deck load, you know, and that's that's what it's called—a deck load strike. They launch everything they have. It's a hell of a lot of aircraft they're going out there. They're sending a, a, a strike from from the carriers out there. So the Japanese pilot and overall aerial command, they reach the supposed point of interception, only to look down and find an oiler and a destroyer. And he's like, nah, this can't be what we're out here for. Yeah, so he can we must have missed on. it. Right. So he continues on. They fly over uh the the Neo show and the Sims, and then they realize that no, this is actually what they sent us out here to do. And we got to do something with this. We're not going to return empty-handed. So he is given permission to strike these two vessels. And I mean, it's no surprise here. You know, the USS Sims is sunk very quickly. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, they give a good account of themselves, but they're, he, you know, it's a destroyer and an oiler against an entire Japanese airstrike. So the destroyer is sunk very quickly. Neosho is, is basically left in a derelict state. You know, she's abandoned, but she's floating she's still afloat she's still she remains afloat for a couple of days until she's scuttled by an american destroyer who finds her and what's left of her crew adrift in the pacific ocean but this is the really the second theoretically uh, of many mistakes made by both sides here you know fletcher sends out the cruisers the japanese think they see a carrier and they attack an oiler um and it, and it just goes back and forth and back and forth for the rest of the event here until the following day um at about 8.15 that morning, same morning, May 7th, uh, a Yorktown SBD piloted by a guy named John Nielsen uh, finds the Japanese screening force under Admiral Goto, which includes the light carrier Shoho. An error in Nielsen's coding says that he found two, two. CVs instead yeah. of just one. So this gets back to uh, the the error, the, the erroneous report gets back to Admiral Fletcher, who says, Oh man, I've got two carriers out here that Nielsen's found. We're going to launch the kitchen sink. So he does the exact same thing mm -hmm. that the Japanese admiral did. He launches a deck load from Yorktown and Lexington. But happily, sends, it's more than just an oiler and a destroyer that he finds. It is. It is. But it's not the the meat make, on the table. It's yeah. not the fleet carriers. Right, right. Right. So he sends everything he's got out there, which is, as I said, a full deck load from Lexington, a full deck load from Yorktown. And they're going out there to find what they think are two Japanese fleet carriers, Shokaku and Zuikaku. And it actually is the light carrier Shoho that they mm -hmm. stumble upon. Um, and the beating that the American air groups give Shoho is it's merciless. The first group that finds Shoho or that comes in contact with her is Lexington Air Group under the command of Bill Alt is the guy's name. Um, they arrive over Shoho first. Lexington, or Yorktown's group is not far behind. They're probably about 30, 35 minutes behind Lexington's air group-ish, mm -hmm. give or take a few minutes. Um, and this is really the only successful, coordinated American carrier air attack, air attack of 1942. And it's, it's counterintuitive because it was the first one. And usually, exactly. <laughs> usually you start out bad and learn over time and get better. Exactly. But this this one is the only one we do right in the entire year. Per, damn near. Damn yeah. near. Because, I mean, if you get into Midway, you know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of luck involved in what happens in those famous four minutes on June yeah. 4th. But, but this is a really well coordinated attack you know and and it's it's, it's a single carrier attack but it's still well coordinated very much so and, mm -hmm. and that and that the fighters are covering everybody uh the spds are up high the tbds are down low the tbd tbd devastators now you know they split into a hammer and anvil attack on shoho and you know to and and explaining that bill can you explain well, we'll we see the ships turn as ships driving forward when they see a torpedo they're going to maneuver in such a way to, to improve the probability that the torpedo will miss. Well, if you sh you attack from both bow uh, directions at the same time and drop torpedoes in from both bow directions, there's no place to go. Right. You turn port to avoid the ones on starboard, turn port to avoid the ones on port, turn hard port. doesn't matter what you do. One of those torpedoes is going to get you. That's exactly. a hammer and anvil attack. Exactly. And, and, and that's exactly what happens here. Uh, it's the, really the only successful attack 
made by the TBD Devastator in World War II against an enemy ship. It was an obsolete airplane, even yeah. then. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it was it was way old. Mm -hmm. But this is the only time in the Pacific War where the TBDs attack a, 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 a you know, a worthy target and hit it and, mm -hmm. and, and, and help sink it. I mean, Shoho takes at least, they think, at least two bomb hits from um, the SBDs that are attacking. Mm -hmm. This is VS2 and VB2, uh, bombing two and scouting two from Lexington. Um, and, you know, their accuracy is not, frankly, what it should be. But the TBDs lay into it. Uh, there, there are at least five confirmed torpedo hits against Shoho or on Shoho by the TBDs of VT2. This is kind of the opposite of what's going to happen in Midway again. Complete opposite. Head, right? yeah, yeah, complete opposite. And part of this is because while Shoho does have some cap, they have some combat air patrol up in the air, it's very, very minimal. Mm -hmm. And it's a coordinated American attack. So the F4Fs that are there and the SBDs to a point also can help fend off some of these zeros. So the TBDs right. kind of come in there unmolested. They, I mean, they're mm -hmm. facing any aircraft fire. But they're kind of coming in unmolested and they're able to do what they can do. Yeah. And they actually they they lay a pretty good hit in there. They they really mm -hmm. do. They they put a lick on Shoho so much so that by the time Lexington Air Group is pulling away, she's pretty much done for already. And then uh, the Yorktown Air Group shows up. Exactly. And then Yorktown, you know, she just adds more fuel to the fire, just you know, more insult to injury, Literally. if you will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in Yorktown Air Group, uh, it's estimated that she, that they uh, laid 11 bombs on Shoho and two more torpedoes. Yeah. Um, you know, the 11 bombs could be attributed to their, and I mean, that's just guesstimates because they stopped counting the hits on Shoho, much like you would see at Midway on Kaga. But uh, it's, it's, she's slowing down. She's going down. She's already mm -hmm. going down by the head. She's going down by the bow. Um, I knew a couple of guys that were in Torpedo Squadron 2 uh, flew in the same airplane. Uh, Walt That's Nelson, also Lexington, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Walt Nelson and Ted Wiebe um, were uh, bombardier and, and radium and gunner uh, on, on the TVDs as they were attacking Shoho. Um, they, I remember Walt, who was the radium and gunner, he was in the backseat. He, he was watching Shoho as she got hit. By their, but what they think is their torpedo. There's an image of Shoho being attacked, and you can see Lexington TVDs in the air, and you can see a huge plume water of water. Plume. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very evident she got hit by a torpedo there. And mm -hmm. the thought is, and the stacking of the flights is that, or the stacking of the of the squadron rather, is that it was uh, Nelson and Weeby's aircraft that did, in fact, do that damage to Shoho. Mm -hmm. But I remember Walt saying that. As they were pulling away, and you got to remember a TBD pulling away is like a snail crawling uphill, you know, yeah, right. it's not really getting out there fast. Yeah, he could, he was watching her go down by the bow, you know, mm. and 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 by the time uh Yorktown's group got there, they just beat the living brains out of what was left of that thing. And by the time they do pull out, um, she's barely afloat by 11 35 that morning. Well, in Show fact, the, the uh, Yorktown's air group starts attacking the other ships too right because they realize correct you know, geez we've pounded this one into submission yeah. what else is a value here yeah but even even so even so yeah. two two full american air groups and two coordinated attacks hit you know this carrier and i mean it's it's kind of like it's you know the bullet the sharks of blood in the water you know it's, yeah. it's the first time they these guys are getting a crack at a japanese aircraft carrier and they just lay waste mm. so fletcher was kind of upset that there weren't two aircraft carriers he wasted both air wings on a single escort carrier exactly and 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 that's the thing too is you know he he takes nielsen at his word which he's supposed to that's what the guy's out there for absolutely and he launches you know two full strikes at what is of course later determined to be an escort carrier or a light carrier whatever you want mm. however you want to call it and when nielsen gets back to Yorktown, he goes up to Admiral Fletcher and says, eh, I'm sorry. I know I coded that, or, you know, his radio and gunner actually coded it wrong. Regardless of this, the message that I sent is wrong. It's not two carriers. It's actually one. And Fletcher loses his mind on Nielsen. And frankly, rightfully so. Yeah. Be because the young aviator and his radio and gunner are the ones that screw this up. And Fletcher knows that he just sent the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. at, at a you know a second line ship if you will 
Yep. And he is now exposed to anything that might come from the big boys. Both of his carriers are exposed now. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. right. So he he loses his mind on Nielsen and and he has every right to do so. Yeah. But it does meet with success because as the air groups are pulling away from Shoho, as I said, as we said, you know, they're, they, they pummel this thing into submission and, and you know, pulverize it. Uh, one of the more famous radio transmissions of the Pacific War is made by a guy named Bob Dixon mm-hmm. from uh, Bombing Squadron 2 on USS Lexington. He radios back. It was a prearranged signal. So, you know, for years it was thought to be off the cuff, but it wasn't. It was a prearranged signal. He radios back to Admiral Fitch aboard Lexington and he says, quote, Scratch, scratch one, flat, one top. flat top, right? That's yeah. it. Yeah. Scratch one flat top. And it's the first time we sink, you know, a Japanese, like a, a significant man of war. No, it's not, you know, Shokaku, Zurikaku, but it's still an aircraft carrier. And 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 we beat its brains out, you know, yeah. we absolutely mm-hmm. pummel it. Now, what do the Japanese do, you know, at this point? Not a whole hell of a lot right now. On on the on the seventh of May, they don't do much. They're trying to, you know, remember they send out everything they have against the Neo Show and the Sims. God bless them, mm-hmm. but uh, they don't really do anything else. They do theoretically find the location of the American aircraft carriers later that day, as the sun is setting. Um, they do make a launch. Uh, the Japanese do send out a strike against the American aircraft carriers, but they can't find them because it's getting dark. Mm-hmm. Um, some of their aviators, it's it's kind of a odd story, but some of their aviators, as they were coming into land on what they thought were their home carriers, they actually tried to land on Yorktown. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the fleets were that yep. close. Uh-huh. Yeah, they 60 were that miles, close. I think, or something yeah. like that at this point. Something like 60 nautical yeah. miles, I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, they were that close that, they, you know, neither of them really realized how close they were. Mm. And the Japanese, as it's getting dark, you know, they're coming in with these odd colored landing lights on their airplanes and they're making odd approaches as you know not the typical approach that u.s naval aircraft do and uh at the last second as these guys are literally hooked down getting ready to land on the uss yorktown it is realized by american forces that those ain't SBDs. <laughs> And the fleet lights it up, and they throw mm. up everything. Everything just, you know, it's like as they say, Fourth There's of July. There's actually some film footage of this because, and you could tell because the trajectory of the anti-aircraft fire is is horizontal. Yeah, it's very so they're, low. They're shooting at aircraft that are very low, basically in the landing pattern. Yeah. And so, yeah, they 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 light it up. The Japanese realize too. Oh crap! Mm. This isn't Chicago, and they you know, pour the coal to them and get out of there. Uh, it's not known if they shot any down. It is mm-hmm. known that several of the Japanese aircraft that were sent out on that strike did not make it back to their carriers. Now, whether they got lost or they got shot down, nobody knows. But but it was a rather odd instance in the Pacific War. And it just mm-hmm. kind of adds to the confusion and the chaos that actually is the Battle of Coral Sea. So the 7th of May ends rather well for the United States. You know, we... Uh, Granted, we lose an oiler and a destroyer, but we sink a carrier and we don't suffer any damage to our aircraft carriers, Lexington and Yorktown, in return. So mm-hmm. day one of the first carrier battle of the war is, you know, one up for the U.S. Right. <laughs> but day two does not necessarily turn out like that. No. So as opposed to other carrier battles that we're going to talk about in 42, you know, Coral Sea is a two day event, well, three day, really, technically, if you want to be. You know, completely technical. Uh, the next day, May 8th, both forces, American and Japanese, uh, you know, they launched their scouts early in the morning, as they do always, and they both find each other almost simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Um, similar to what happened the day before, you know, uh, the intelligence, however, on this day is, that, and by intelligence, I'm talking about the sighting reports, are actually fairly accurate. I said everything before was erroneous except for the last day, this is the last day, you know, the Americans cite the Japanese uh, fleet carrier, Shikaku, Zuikaku, the Japanese cite the American fleet carriers, Lexington and Yorktown. Mm-hmm. And as a result, both admirals launch, again, just about yeah. everything they got. The Americans beat the Japanese into the air by maybe 15 minutes, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, th- these guys are close to one another now, um, not within visual range, but it's, it, they're close. And, 
the opposing air groups actually pass one another in the air. Mm -hmm. The Lexington and Yorktown air groups pass Shokaku and Zuikaku air groups as they're heading to each other. Do they targets. sight each other? Oh, yeah, they see each other. Wow. And they just keep on. There is some dogfighting mm -hmm. and some mixing up in the air, but nothing very significant yet. Mm -hmm. um, this is also not the first time that this happens in the Pacific War. We'll see it again at Santa Cruz in mm -hmm. October. Right. But um, the well-coordinated attacks of May 7th, the previous day, give way to the absolute Mayhem. mess yeah, yeah, that is May 8th. So everything mm -hmm. that went right for the Americans on the 7th goes completely opposite on May 8th. The weather has a plays a role in that too as well. Right. It, cer it certainly does. Yeah. You know, as as you know, the, the carriers are spotted and they're coming in, the American air groups are coming in and the only carrier that they see is Shikaku. Now they see Zuikaku, she kind of dips in and out of a rain squall. Mm -hmm. But as the Yorktown air group is coming in, they can't find Zuikaku, Zuikaku to attack her. So they throw everything at Shokaku. Right. And and they they. They put a pretty good lick on Shikaku. I think she's hit, um, well, she's hit several times. She's hit several times, at least twice uh, by two 1,000-pound bombs dropped by Yorktown's air group under the command of a guy named Bill Birch. Mm -hmm. Bill Birch is leading this strike. Um, Shikaku's moving radically. You know, I mean, she's twisting and turning like a kind of like a snake on a sidewalk, and and yet they're still able to hit her. And, and these two bombs... Uh, they they destroy the well. I don't want to say they destroy. They disable the flight deck in such a way that Shikaku is burning pretty pretty severely. Mm -hmm. She's uh, she's she's on fire. Her flight deck is ruined for the present time, and it's very clear that she's going to be of no more use in this event. Uh, so she's her captain requests permission to retire and is given that permission now. Before we get to her tailing off here, she's attacked by TBDs from Yorktown and Lexington, and she's not hit one time. Yeah. Um, the success of May 7th does not translate to May 8th. And we've uh, had, we're going to have torpedo problems for the first year and a half of this right. war, as it turns out. Right. And it's not clear whether the TBDs just missed or whether the, there were some impacts and the, and the torpedoes didn't detonate. Well, and that's the thing is that there were. There, there were reports on on both sides, well, specifically Americans, that the torpedoes did strike Shikaku, but failed to explode. Now, mm. most of the torpedoes that were launched against the carrier just flat out miss. Mm. And the reasons for that are skillful maneuvering by the Japanese captain and just, frankly, poor marksmanship on the point of the TBD pilots on uh, Yorktown and Lexington's air group. But... All the success that the TBDs had the day before does not translate to the eighth. They do no underwater ship killing damage to Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the DC party on Chicago winds up putting out the fires. But as I said, she's wrecked in such a state that she can't participate in the event anymore. And she retires on full speed, flank speed, and gets the hell out of the area. Um, Zui Kaku, you know, as we mentioned before, is coming in under uh, a rain squall and she is attacked when she does pop out, but it's no damage is done to her. Lexington's air group, you know, as, as coordinated as they were the day before, again, it's like, I don't, you know, you got to wonder what the hell happened because half the air group for Lexington couldn't even find a target. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's unclear to me, what exactly happened in the air there, but it's very clear. I mean, literally half the air group found the target. The other half didn't find anything at all. So something, something happened there. And it's just, it's just a, it sucks because the damage that they could have done is, is, you know, something significant. That, yeah. 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 It really is. But um, the Japanese, on the other hand, they know where Yorktown and Lexington are. And the haphazard way that we attack their carriers, you know, at almost the same time, really, is an opposite reflection of what the Japanese do to our carriers, Lexington and Yorktown. And they before come you jump in that, you, before yeah. you jump to the, what happened, it's even more remarkable because we had radar and they did not, right? Right, right. So we were able to see their incoming aircraft at 
a range of maybe 60 miles or something right. like that. And so we should have been able to direct our combat air patrol to intercept. And we didn't do that. Why not? Well, <clears throat> you, you nailed it when you said about 60 miles. It was actually 68 okay. nautical miles is where the, so you, you were damn close, uh, where the radar picked them up. Mm -hmm. And the radar I'm talking about is Lexington CXAM radar mm -hmm. picks up the Japanese coming in. So we know they're coming. Not only do we see them literally pass pass one another, but the radar picks them up. And uh, the fighter director on Lexington vectors out his cap, his combat air patrol to intercept the incoming Japanese strike, but fails to place them at the proper altitude. Mm. Um, the F-4Fs weren't at, the, they were either too low or too high. They were not where they needed to be to intercept the Japanese coming in. So what little uh we and we had the aircraft in the air to do a fairly significant amount of damage it's just they were in the wrong place at the wrong time so it wasn't because the wildcat was a really crappy no. fighter no it's because we directed them improperly which Absolutely. You know, they're not as good as a zero to begin with and then no. we because that's one hand tied behind your back and then when you send them to the wrong altitude that's two hands tied behind your yeah back. you can't You're do anything gonna... if you yeah you can't do anything if you can't find them yeah, you can't right. hit them if you can't see them. Mm. And by the and, and and let me be clear, they do see them. You know, mm. the Lexington's combat and and well, the American fleet because the Yorktown had some people up there too. They do see the Japanese, but they can't get to them. By the time mm. they get to them, come on, the attack is over. They're gone. They wind up do shooting down a few on their way out, but that doesn't do anything for what happens. Now, this point of the war, just to step back to the tactics for a moment. You you need fighters to cover what we've been calling the combat air patrol, which right. is to protect the aircraft carriers. But you also need fighters to accompany the attack right. force, right. and so that requires a lot of fighters. Yes. And you know because basically two X, we didn't have we didn't populate our aircraft carriers with a sufficient number of fighters during the Battle of Corsi. We're going to change that later. We're going to learn from this battle and add more fighters to the carrier um, air, air wing complement. But for this battle, how do we make up for the fact that we didn't have enough fighters to cover both combat air patrol and cover the attacking airplanes that are going after the Japanese carriers? So it's this is one of the stranger aspects of this battle is that, just as you said, we didn't have enough fighters. What Yorktown does is they put up SBDs, Dauntless Dive Bombers, as anti-torpedo plane patrols. The SBDs, Scout not, Bomber not Douglas, much okay. <laughs> it, it was nicknamed by the pilots the slow but deadly. You know, I mean, this is one of the most successful aircraft yep. of World War II. However, it was not designed to be a fighter plane. Uh, it was not designed to fly combat air patrol, yet it continues to do so. You see it a couple times later on in the Pacific War, but this is really okay. the first time that it's done because it's strange because we don't have enough fighters, as you said. We don't have the fighters to do both combat air patrol yeah, jobs at once you know? exactly yeah. and you got to do what you got to do so they send out these dauntless don't lie i don't know the plural <laughs> dauntless would be they send them out to be anti-torpedo plane patrol mm -hmm. uh combat air patrol if, however you want to talk about it um one of the pilots is a guy named stanley vedaza uh they nicknamed him nicknamed him the swede swede vedaza he was a personal friend of mine that i knew for many many years i knew him very very well mm -hmm. now swede uh, again he's a dive bomber pilot in vs scouting squadron five on uss yorktown he is out there and he knew he's like this is not what this airplane is designed to do no yeah, he's a combat good no no he's a combat vet so he's flown the lay in salamal raid which is something we did not talk about mm -hmm. he's flown the strike on Tulagi. He flew the strike on Shoho the day before, and theoretically, he's credited with being one of the ones who had her. And now he's out there flying as Dauntless as anti-torpedo plane patrol. Well, he is flying in formation in, in a company with two other SBDs. It's a gaggle of three. And he notices something out of the corner of his eye, a glint uh, you know, in the sky, a glint of metal, and, you know, flash. And he's like, that's, you know, we don't have anybody back there. He immediately breaks the formation because mm -hmm. he knows what's coming it's a japanese air attack uh the japanese pass through its its uh, aircraft from zuikaku they pass through 
the formation of SPDs and shoot down both of Swede's wingmen. Mm -hmm. And Swede maneuvers himself out of the way. And in turn, Swede finds himself in a dogfight in his SPD with three Japanese aircraft. And it it becomes an event. You know, most dogfights, if you look at any fighter, if you talk to any fighter pilot from World War II of any nation, most dogfights are seconds long, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a minute or two, maybe. This goes on from, you know, Swede estimated after, you know, after the years after the event, he estimated anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes that these guys are trying to shoot him down their fighter planes well, scissoring, it probably takes him that him. long just to turn but, uh... <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a hell of a pilot sweet was I was a hell of a yeah. pilot and he is in this dogfight with these three enemy aircraft and you know that dauntless has two crew members it's got a pilot and it's got a radio and gunner behind him mm -hmm. and the whole purpose well two purpose for the radio and gunner is to be the radio man to radio and to send messages and receive messages, you know, and then also he's got uh, an AM to 30 caliber air cooled machine gun in the back of that SPD to protect the tail mm -hmm. of that airplane. Swede is maneuvering his Dauntless so violently that the rear seat gunner can't actually pick the weapon up to fire at the Japanese behind him. He can't protect the six. So, no, because yeah. Swede is throwing this thing around so harshly mm -hmm. and doing you know, what he's frankly born to do, which is to be a fighter pilot. You'll hear about Sweet again in another episode or two. Um, he skillfully maneuvers his SPD out of the way to where he does not get shot down by these three Japanese aircraft. That's he, incredible. Shoots, he shoots them down. All three. All three in his SPD Dauntless dive bomber. This is the birth. Yeah, no kidding. This is the birth. And he's not the only guy to do it at Coral Sea. There was another fellow, another SPD pilot named John Lepla. Mm -hmm. who did the same thing. I don't think he shot, I think he shot down two, but regardless, mm -hmm. he shoots down enemy aircraft with a dauntless dive bomber. And, and Swede is a born fighter pilot. You know, there's a myth about how, Oh, after they heard about this, you know, he was recruited to fighting 10 for Jim with Jimmy flatly. That's not true at all. Swede actually had already been given orders to report to fighting squadron 10 two days before um, the battle occurred course, he yeah. was yeah he was mm -hmm. supposed to go back to pearl harbor aboard the oiler neo show mm -hmm. and he begged the air group commander aboard yorktown to say hey look you know, I, yeah because i know yeah. this fleet action's coming well, you're gonna need me neo show didn't make it back anyway so it was a good move both ways Ex exactly yeah. sweet participates in the raid on shoho gets a, gets mm -hmm. a hit next day he shoots down three japanese aircraft in his spt yeah incredible and he goes on to be become one of America's most decorated fighter pilots of the Pacific theater. Wow. And we'll talk about him in future episodes. But it's one of the stranger aspects of Coral Sea, but it's freaking Regardless cool. of, <laughs> despite Swede's um, valiant attempts, the American carriers are still struck, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. You know, Yorktown's hit by a couple of bombs. Um, they don't kill Yorktown, obviously, but they do some significant damage to her. And, you know, she winds up going back to the yard. And, of course, you know, they, everybody well, one of the story. One of the things that happens to her is, you know, her elevators are put out of commission. At least that's what they thought. And and she loses her superheaters for her boilers, right. which means she can't do flight speed anymore, which are, affects her ability to evade right. um, all these incoming attacks. So, that, that, that she's going to see in a month. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the other aircraft, and, and, and to be clear, Yorktown does survive this this battle, but the other aircraft carrier uh, in, in her company, the USS Lexington, does not. Uh, Lexington is, and, and let's you know set the stage here, Lexington's an old carrier. She's the Number second. Two. Yeah, yeah, CV2, exactly. She's a converted battle cruiser. You know, I, I say that. She was, she was turned into an aircraft carrier on a battle cruiser hull. Mm -hmm. um she's, she's very fast i mean she could knock down you know just south or right at 30 knots she could move she she could get mm -hmm. out out there to clip but she was huge and she turned like i i like to say she turned like a whale i mean she just you know slow at the helm sluggish at the helm and it was very very difficult for her to evade the torpedoes that are coming in and she gets hit by two bombs mm -hmm. neither of which really 
do much. I mean, they they unfortunately kill uh, you know Marine gunners on the uh, on the port side gun gallery, uh, but they don't knock the ship out of action. The fires that are started by the bombs are quickly put out. It's the torpedoes that she takes, and she only takes two. But one of the torpedoes that she does take ruptures her avgas tanks. And, and this is what happens when you take a battle cruiser and convert it into an aircraft carrier. You know, the fuel stowage is not what it's supposed to be. You know, it, and the it fuel lines isn't. aren't run the way they should have been run. No, yep, no, they're absolutely. not. No, they're not. And, and it's just, you know, I mean, this is a carrier that was built and commissioned in 1927. So mm -hmm. she's she's an old lady. And, uh, you know, it's just she wasn't designed for modern carrier warfare and this is her is her seals her fate you know it really and there, but there were actually procedures that if they put into effect could might have mitigated the damage but um we weren't smart enough to know to do that during the battle of coral sea we actually changed the procedures on how to use treat the fuel lines before midway right which has a big impact on the outcome of midway oh for sure but we didn't know Right. We didn't know, you know, and the thing is, it, the, the, the the frustrating thing is, is that Lexington takes her two torpedo hits. She takes her bomb hits like a champ, like she's not going down, man. I mean, she does. She does go down by the bow. She is going down by the head a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you look at images of her after she's hit, it's very evident in the picture. She is down by the bow, mm -hmm. but she's still conducting flight ops. She's still right. landing and launching aircraft after this. 20 she's, knots, something like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. She's not dying. Mm -hmm. It's the internal leaking of the avgas fumes, not the fuel itself, mind you, the fumes yeah, from the, the ruptured tanks that seals her fate. The, the crew was adhering to the old Navy dictum, don't give up the ship. They were not. They were fighting. No. Oh. But that the avgas fumes, there were DC motors and right. even when I was chief engineer on a nuclear submarine, we had some DC motors. And DC motors use these carbon brushes to, to contact, to, to transit the electricity from the rotor to the stator. And those ca carbon brushes spark, mm -hmm. even as late as the 1980s, 1990s. Those, we still had these carbon brushes that occasionally would spark. Mm -hmm. And you take the ga aviation gasoline that's leaking from all these broken pipes from the torpedo attack and then you sparking dc motors and that's a recipe Boom. for an explosion and Boom. that's what happened that's, that's exactly what actually what took her out yeah yeah i mean the japanese i mean you could say the japanese sunk her because it was a torpedo hit that caused the avgas tanks to rupture mm -hmm. it caused the fumes to spread and kaboom but you know, the damage was, control teams were controlling the flooding. Yeah, it was looking like the you know they were still doing flight ops until the yeah. explosion, which uh, at that point could not be avoided. No, there's nothing that they could do. It was unexpected. You know, mm -hmm. as you said, they had righted. She did have a little bit of a list. She was down by the head, but they they counter flooded and they righted the ship. And as you said, she's conducting flight ops. People aboard her inside of Lex stated after the fact they could smell fuel. Now it's an aircraft mm -hmm. carrier, so you can smell fuel pretty much all the time, but they're smelling fuel where they're not supposed to be smelling yeah. fuel, like down in the bowels of the ship. Mm -hmm. And and exactly what you said just happened, or exactly what you just said happened in that, you know, one of the DC, it's thought, and it's probably correct, one of those DC motors sparks. And there's a tremendous explosion inside of Lexington that actually wipes out. That was out caught her on piece. film too, I think, wasn't it? The the later ones were, but yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But that that first major explosion wipes mm. out her main DC party, her damage control damage party. Control party. Yeah. So at that point, you know, the fires are starting to spread, uh, and I believe it or not, Lexington is still conducting flight ops after these explosions. And I say explosions, plural, because there were multiple. Mm. And that's what winds up killing her eventually. Uh, Captain Ted Sherman, who was the skipper of Lexington, you know, he waited until the absolute last minute to finally give the order to abandon ship. Lexington slows down. She stops. And if you look at footage, like you're talking about, Bill, there's you can see our imagery. You can see Lexington literally is being consumed from the bow to the stern. She's the fire's coming all the way down. 
the she length still and breadth has of the ship. Operable aircraft on her flight deck that uh, quite a few that go down with the ship. Yeah, like thirty five of them, I yeah. think thirty five or thirty six. And you know, it's one of the more. Um, it, it, it's a very calm evacuation of the vessel. You know, again, the guys I talked about before, Ted, uh, Ted Weeby and Walt Nelson. You know, they were on the flight deck, took their shoes off. Everybody lines their shoes up in neat, orderly rows. Climb down the rope. Well, they're eating ice cream before they go down. So <laughs> they go raid the Gidunk stand, and and they're eating ice cream on the flight deck before they go over. You know, they're waiting for their turn to climb. Yeah, down the rope yeah, it was water. very calm yeah. and orderly and they, mm. they go down the lines into the water they're picked up by destroyers and cruisers mm -hmm. and off they go but but lex is just eating herself alive and sherman is the last guy to go over he mm. uh, he's walking off the the flight deck to go into the water and he turns around and he says to, says to his exo he says wait a minute i gotta go get something and initially they thought that sherman was going to try and go down with the ship you know, mm -hmm. he was going to like barricade himself and go Which down. Which was with the happening ship. in the Imperial Japanese Navy. But, right. right. But Sherman goes back, back inside the aircraft carrier and grabs his, his ceremonial dress cover. His, you know, as I call it, the Captain Kid cap. You, you mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about. I know yeah. you do. Yeah. Well, Puts it, it on. Like an Admiral Nelson hat or whatever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Puts it on and goes over the, over the side of the aircraft carrier and he looks at his XO and he says, well, hell, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it in style. <laughs> and, I mean, you gotta love the guy's attitude you yeah know? but but it's 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 a sad thing to see because it's the footage that, that i'm going to show in in the video version of this podcast you'll see mm -hmm. it it's just you know the ship is being eaten alive you know yeah yeah and then it's this final this final tremendous explosion on the stern which we think are her torpedo warheads cooking off mm -hmm. and it flings airplanes over the side of the flight deck and everything else i mean and she's just she's gone there's nothing yeah so we lose the Lexington and we've already radioed, we've already hinted that Yorktown will be around for Midway. Right. Um, and so we lose one carrier and the other one's heavily damaged. And what do the Japanese think happened to us? Japanese think we, they sunk everything we had. Right. You know, they yeah. think correctly that they've sunk Lexington. They mm -hmm. actually identified her as Saratoga, but I mean, it is what it is. Well, they look the same, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and they think that they sunk the Yorktown, which of course mm -hmm. they did not. And they actually also reported having sunk the battleship California. This goes back to Admiral Crace's, yeah. you know, un unfortunate incidents out there. Um, but which the wasn't Japanese, there. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, California wasn't there. They actually, you know, they think this is a tremendous victory over the United States Navy. And, and to an they extent, only lost Shoho when they right. damaged to. Which other carrier? Shokaku is is damaged uh, enough, and 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 this is why Coral Sea is so important to right. the future events of the Pacific War. Yes, we lose Lexington, and yes, we sink the Shoho. However, we damage Shokaku in such a way that she is not able to participate in the Battle in Midway. of Midway, and she was slated to go. And what about Zuikako? Zuikako is not touched. She's not physically touched. However, her air group losses are so severe she that she pilots. Correct. She too cannot participate in the upcoming Battle of Midway. So if Coral Sea doesn't happen, or if it doesn't happen in the way we see it happens, there's six carriers at Midway as opposed to four right. Japanese. And who knows what the outcome would have been had there been six Japanese aircraft carriers at Midway instead of four. I think you could make the argument that it would not have been good. <laughs> yeah, we only had three. One could argue two and a half because Yorktown is not a full up round. When she participates in Midway, um, and we'll talk about that later, is the, the miracle of getting York, Yorktown underway from Midway. So it's a tactical loss for the United States. We lost one fleet carrier, and the other one severely damaged. Right. The Japanese lose one light carrier, and two carriers are taken out of action for Midway. Right. right. So it turns out to be a a draw or perhaps even a strategic victory because it leads to a, a real victory at midway correct and you know it, it, that's exactly right it, this is not a tactical victory for the united states because trading nimitz himself said trading lexington for shoho is it's not a good not acceptable good ex, yeah we can't it's not a good that. exchange you know a good, mm -hmm. good rate of exchange it's not gonna have that is not how we do things but the japanese because of the fact that that Shoho is destroyed, 
Shokaku and Zuikaku are put out of action. Shokaku turns tail and goes back home. Zuikaku doesn't have the air group really to do anything. The Japanese planned invasion of Port Moresby is stopped. Uh, this the, the planned invasion from the sea, right? right. Landing invasion. This Port particular Morsby. invasion. Yeah, and and in fact, the Japanese changed their strategy to conduct a over the mountains land right. invasion of Port Moresby. Yeah which effectively neutralizes it because that becomes way harder than they ima ever imagined it would yeah. be. The Owen Stanley Mountains are not uh, not the Smokies. You know? No, no. They're a little more difficult and the Australians yeah. had, a little, had a little something to say there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the thing is, is that this is the first time in the Pacific War, and this is huge, that the Japanese advance is checked. It's, is stopped, yep, absolutely. Yeah. This is it. And not just the maritime advance, with the fleets, but also the the land war with the you know, the taking of Port Moresby, both the tactical issue, operational issue with the fleet and the land objective are not achieved. Right, and this is this is a slap in the face to the Japanese, and this is a feather in the cap for the United States, and that we were fully aware that the Japanese were trying to invade Port Moresby. We're also fully aware that this particular invasion, this invasion fleet has been turned around. So mm -hmm. while losing the Lexington is something, it's obviously very regrettable. We accomplish our mission and that we stop the Japanese from doing what they wanted to do. And it's the first time in the Pacific, Pacific War that we do that. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's huge. You know, we'll, we're, we're going to argue, I'm sure, at some point, you know, that Midway is the, not the turning point of the Pacific War, in my opinion, is staunch mm -hmm. in that it is not. However, the events that happen all the way back from February 42 at the hit and run carrier raids and the Doodler raid and Coral Sea and Midway do start that turn of mm -hmm. events. You know, it really does. You know, the meat grinder at Guadalcanal is going to be the, the ultimate decision maker, but that turn is started here at Coral Sea. And from the grand strategy standpoint, Nimitz is very, very specific, not precise, but specific in his guidance for Midway. Yep. And that is that the, um, the, the strategy of calculated risk right. will be used in deciding how to execute the campaign at Midway. Right. And he said that because he realized we can't keep up the exchange rate that we no. saw at the Battle of Corsi. No, so it just changes the guidance, makes it, you know, very specific, but not precise. And I say that because he still gives the operational commander the flexibility to decide exactly how to conduct the campaign. Mm -hmm. But the first thing he's got to keep in mind is what do you risk versus what do you intend to gain? And that's how he defined calculated risk. Right. And that's that's how he governs himself and his commanders, uh, certainly for the next month or so anyway, all the way through June. And, you know, the thing is to hit on that, what you just said, Bill, is that, you know, there was no parity at this point in terms of mm -hmm. U.S. and Japanese carrier forces. Yeah, we sunk one, but we also lost one. And we were below we were behind the eight ball to begin with. To begin all with, we right? had was mm -hmm. Yorktown, Lexington. Enterprise Hornet ain't well Hornet is there by now, so so you got four carriers. Uh, Saratoga is laid up in the yard in Bremerton for having taken a torpedo, and they, the Japanese got Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Shokaku, Zuikaku. There's six fleet carriers mm -hmm. versus you know ours, so there is no parity at this point, and, mm -hmm. and it's something that governs everything that he does for the he being Nimitz for the next at least month and and, and even further. Right, so. Closing this one up, what lessons do we learn here? You know, some of the things you you, you mentioned it briefly uh, before is, you know, damage control operations aboard Yorktown. Frankly, save her. You know, she could have been. She was already severely damaged, but she could have, you know, had a really bad day if her uh, damage control officer hadn't flushed out her fuel lines. This is something that we learn at mm. Coral Sea. They fill the uh, lines with what? What CO two? Carbon dioxide, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right midway. And this becomes SOP for American mm -hmm. carrier operations for the rest of the war. Right. And uh, Japanese don't do this, and we 
see the results yeah, of that. Our advantages of intelligence and damage control really, really um, you continue. There, there were an advantage here and they continue to be through the next three years. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the lessons that we learn here, aside from those, you know, is maybe try and coordinate your air attacks. Yes. You know? yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I would say broader than that, one of the lessons we could have learned that we failed to was that the Japanese operate the carriers, uh, the carriers in concert with each other differently than we do. We still had times when the two carriers strike groups, I'll use modern terminology, were out of um, line of sight communications and had no idea what the other one was doing. Mm -hmm. So in theory, they're both under the command of Fletcher, but they're separated by, let's say, 60 miles, and they're conducting independent attacks and operations without coordinating because they're under emissions control, MCON, radio silence. Mm -hmm. And so they're not telling each other what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that failure to coordinate, um, it, they, we assume the Japanese were operating their carriers the same way. In fact, they were operating them in tandem. So yeah. they operated their multiple carriers basically as a single organic uh, operational entity. Yeah. And, and so if we had known that, we would have approached Midway a little bit differently. And Probably. we would have understood that they might actually be operating four aircraft carriers together in a coordinated fashion, despite the fact that that's not the way we operated. Right. So we could have learned from the way Shokaku and Zuikaku were operating together, and we didn't figure that out yet at Coral Sea. And, you know, not to, not to look too far into the future, but mm -hmm. this is something piss poor coordination, frankly, mm -hmm. on the U.S. side is something that this is not the only time that it occurs. It occurs at Midway. Mm -hmm. It occurs all the way in the Guadalcanal, Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz too. Those are yep. the other two carrier battles in 42. Yeah. It's like, dang. Mm -hmm. well, How many you times do we have to learn this lesson, right? Yeah. 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 But yeah, you really don't see a coordinated, heavily coordinated assault from an American aircraft carrier again until 1944. Mm -hmm. Ugh, but uh, what may have been. <laughs> but uh anyway i i think we should uh wrap this sucker up bill what do you yep. think i agree i agree i think we've done well i i hope uh, we've explained the importance of this operation to uh to you guys and and as always if you have any comments or questions please send them in we'll be more than happy to answer them and do our best to to do that very thing or if you want us to explain something further uh bill and i do plan to do an episode hopefully where we can you know answer some of those questions as they come in mm -hmm. But uh, with that being said, uh, we do want to thank you for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcasts and give us a rating and review. And please do give us a rating and review because that does help other people find our podcast. Uh, I'm seeing some ratings come in, but the reviews help too. Tell us what we're doing right. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Um, also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Uh, make sure and look us up on Facebook, like and subscribe our page there as well. Uh, as again, as I said, if you have a question, comment or suggestion, send us an email at unauthorized Pacific podcast at gmail.com. And once again, my name is Seth Perrin, and I want to thank you for listening, Bill. Yeah, this is Bill Toady. Our next three episodes are going to be on the Battle of Midway with our special guest, John Parshall. Tune in. I guarantee you they're going to be great, John is one of the best historians in the world Absolutely. on the Battle of Midway. So please tune in. Absolutely. We'll see you, Seth. Yep. See you, Bill. Take it easy. Take care. Bye. All right.